family from Center for Spiritual Living in Boise, Idaho. We're glad you're with us this morning, whether you're in the sanctuary or uh, hanging out at the house, watching us online, or catching it later in the week. It's kind of snowy today. We're glad you're with us, and we're really glad to have Miss Lisa Biddick here. So give her a hand. Know that they don't have to come in tomorrow. We'll just 
throw up a, 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 a previous video or something. And I just want to, from my heart, say thank you to our volunteers who are here this morning. And thank you, most of all, always, to our great musicians. So let's just give them a hand. And speaking of beauty, this morning we are bringing forth our spiritual practices and our prayer through our beloved Miss Whitman. Yes, yes, Miss Whitman. So please come on up here. Let's just take a moment and turn with you. Our beloved Deborah Whitman is holding the high watch for us this morning and will be available for prayer as all of our practitioners are today. So let's just take a moment and move with them and prepare ourselves in consciousness for this thing called holy, sacred time of communicating with the divine. How blessed we are. So take a deep, cleansing, sacred breath into our strong lungs. And open our hearts. spoken through Deborah. Good morning. It is my honor to introduce Ted McClurg, who will light the world religions candles from the Christ candle. In religious science, we perform this ceremony to acknowledge that all people and all faiths come from one great universal presence, which we call spirit. In lighting these candles, we honor the one, hum the one family of humanity made up of over 4,000 religions and spiritual traditions throughout the world. We light the first candle for the Baha'i faith, who believe that love is the breath of the Holy Spirit inspired into the human spirit. Love is a necessary tie preceding from the realities of things through divine creation. We light the second candle for Islam. The Prophet Muhammad is reported to have said, you will not enter into paradise until you believe, and you will not believe until you love one another. We light the third candle in honor of Christianity. Christians believe that God is the source and essence of eternal love. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. We light the fourth candle for Judaism. The Hebrew, the Hebrew words for love are sometimes rendered in English as loving kindness or steadfast love. The fifth and final candle honors new thought. The essence of love, while elusive, pervades everything, fires the heart, stimulates the emotions, renews the soul, and proclaims the spirit. So now let us quiet our minds and open our hearts to the message being sung by Lisa Betty.
It begins with a death, as so many love stories often do. On March 2, 2012, Lawrence Anthony, a conservationist and author known as the Elephant Whisperer, passed away from a heart attack. After his death, although they were not alerted to the event, a group of wild elephants Anthony had helped to rescue and rehabilitate traveled to his house in the South African province of KwaZulu-Natal. The elephants, who were grazing many, many miles away in different parts of the park, traveled for 12 hours, over 12 hours, to reach his house, where they stayed in silence for more than two days. According to his son Jason, both herds arrived shortly after Anthony's death. They had visited the compound where Anthony lived for over a year and a half, but Jason says in coming there on that day of all days, we certainly believe that they had sensed their beloved's death. It has been reported that exactly one year after his death to the day, and for several years afterwards, the herd marched to the house once again. It's something that science, that reason, that our left brains cannot explain. Anthony was known for his unique ability to calm and to communicate with traumatized elephants. In his book, The Elephant Whisperer, My Life with the Herd in the African Wild, he tells the story of saving the elephant herds at the request of an animal welfare organization in 1999. Everyone else had given up on these herds. He concluded that the only way he could save these elephants who had been categorized as violent and unruly was to live with them. To save their lives, he said, I would stay with them, feed them, talk to them, respect them. But most importantly, I would be with them day and night. He shared their lives, and he loved the elephants, every single one of them. He loved them regardless of their personalities, their peculiarities. He loved the rogue bulls, the domineering matriarchal females, the mischievous toddlers, the wayward teenagers. And he treated them all with respect because he loved them all. And they, in turn, respected him. I want to show you a short video about this amazing love story. And if we can't get the sound, then Rex could come up and play. But...
ever were a time when we can truly sense the wondrous interconnectedness of all beings, it's when we reflect on these animals of Tula Tula. A, man, a man's heart stops, and hundreds of elephant hearts are grieved. This man's oh so abundantly loving heart offered healing to these elephants, and now they come and pay loving homage to their friend. The horse, the, the elephant whisperer showed us that when we come together, animals or humans, our hearts open a gateway to our own healing, to our world's healing, to all healing. That when we take one step towards love, love takes a thousand steps towards us. When we take one step towards love, love will take a thousand steps towards us. Oh, the interconnectedness of all beings, elephants, humans, Mother Earth. On this Valentine's Day, I want us to explore this concept of love as a way to amplify this interconnectedness that we know exists, but that for some reason we forget. But first, let's take a look at this word, love. Valentine's Day, quite frankly, is not one of my favorite days. It never has been. I just remember those days in elementary school where you had to bring those shoe boxes in and make those little slits in the top, and you had to put Valentine's all around, and everybody had stuck their Valentine's in there. I never liked that kind of expression of love. But let's look at this word, love. One of the, it's one of the best feelings on the world. There's no question about it. One of the best feelings in the world. We fall into it. We seek it. We cherish it. We share it. It's an expression and experience that everybody understands, no matter who you are, where you live, what your background is. Yet, as universal as love is, it's also complex. It's powerful. It's an emotion that can be hard to define. What does it even mean, this word love? This word love. Love is a junk drawer we dump all kinds of ideas into, just because we don't have anywhere else to put it. Listen, I love God, and I love cheese enchiladas. For a word that we use so often, love is a word for us that is difficult for us to wrap our minds around. I looked it up in the dictionary, and it's a verb and it's a noun. Hmm. It has over 11 different definitions. Love has to do with God. It has to do with sex. It has to do with romance. It has to do with pets and babies. It even has to do with tennis, as Phil can tell you. See the problem? We use this word, this word love, because it's so broad, it's so generic that I'm not sure we really understand what it means anymore. So how should we define love? For some people, love is tolerance, putting up with. I hear this all the time, even in our own philosophy of religious science. The idea behind this is rather than judge people, we should love them. The idea usually means that we shouldn't call out that anything is wrong. After all, who are we to judge, we ask ourselves. And while that sounds nice and very progressive, of which I am, by the way, it still doesn't quite work for me. If we really loved someone, wouldn't we call out their injustice, their intolerance, their racism, those things that don't work? Wouldn't we, if we really loved them, do that? So I'm not sure that tolerance work, works because the opposite of love is not hate. It's apathy. It's apathy. And I believe that there is a very fine line between apathy and tolerance. But that's another talk, I think, for another day, don't you? So for many of us, love is a passion for a thing or for an activity. It's a word that we conjure up for all, with, to describe all our feelings of affection. We love hiking. We love our new car. We love shoes and that new song by a group we don't even know the name of. We love snow and we love chips and guacamole. We use this word love. When we, use, when we aim this word love at people, we usually mean the exact same thing. When we love somebody, we mean we have a deep feeling of affection for them because they make us feel alive or young or sexual or happy or whatever they make us feel. Love, by this definition, 
is pure, unfiltered emotion. And your love is passive. Your role in this kind of love is passive. It's passive. Think of the phrase, fall in love. Ah, I want to fall in love. It's like tripping over a rock or a curve. And falling in love is fantastic. But there's a dark underbelly to this emotion, to this feeling. Because listen, if you can fall into it, you can fall out. So that's not really love, is it? Not the way we want to think of love, as something that never ends, that you can't fall out of. We have a pretty limited vocabulary for love here in, a, in our English language, at least compared to the Greeks. Yeah, we've got affection, we've got fondness, we've got attraction, but they all kind, kind of sound very vague and pale compared to those Greek words like, Eros, Philia, and Agape. Those Greek words that we like to throw around once a year on Valentine's Day. So what is love? How do we love? Frankly, I'm still looking for that formula. <laughs> if you find it, let me know, would you? In the Sermon of the Mount, in the Sermon on the Mount, the Master, Teacher, and Rabbi, Jesus, spoke of Agape love the Greek word agape, agape love, when he said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Lawrence Anthony loved all those elephants, the mean ones, the sick ones, the old ones, the ornery ones, the ones that attacked him, that matriarchal elephant that finally broke down with love? Are we any less called upon to love people? Any less than this man modeled for us with huge animals like elephants? Jesus, the master teacher, went on to say this, if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same thing? I think tax collectors were not well thought of in Jesus' days or in ours, by the way. And if you salute only your brethren, he said, what more are you, what more are you doing than the others? Do not the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect, he means perfect in love, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, many, many biblical scholars have argued that the word perfect in this, in this verse Matthew 5, 48, is an incorrect translation. What the original text in Greek actually means is this. You must love impartially as the creator of all life loves impartially, as God also loves impartially. That is, when we love others with agape love, we show love without any partiality. To love unconditionally, we can't choose who we want to love and who we don't want to love. We can't pick and choose. Agape love is impartial, almost impersonal in the way that we usually think of love. We're commanded to love everyone. And I think that the elephant whisperer gave us the secret to this. He said, I had to live with them. I had to live with them. We're not talking about moving into somebody's house, but we're talking about walking in their shoes, living with them, understanding them, communicating with them. That is agape love. We can clearly understand this agape love when we think about animals. Most people love all animals with impartiality, even the mean or the sick or the ornery ones. Some people love animals a lot more than they do, they do people. I myself have been accused of that many times. In like manner, animal, dog, animal, many animals, especially dogs, love with agape love. They love impartially. They love completely. They love unconditional. Dogs are called humanity's best friend for a reason. As we know, 
dog is God spelled backwards. So yes, you want to learn how to love unconditionally. Look at your dog. Look at Juno. Where's Juno? Look at Juno loving unconditionally. This dog teaches us. Now listen, I also happen to think that not all dogs do love everybody impartial about the way. They rarely forgive anybody that's mistreated them. That's kind of they've given an S for cats. Many, if not all cats, will rarely deign to show you love, but honestly, those cats are more like dogs, I think. Like my son, these cats. Yeah, they, they love the dog they love, I think. Of course, that's just my humble opinion. If we're completely honest with ourselves, we've got to admit that almost all of us love people with some partiality. We love those who love us back in the same way that we love them. We love those who are cute or cuddly or small or tiny or babies. Most of the time we love particular people. When we say we love particular people, what we're really saying is that we really like them and they really like us. Think about the last time that you could say you loved someone that was rude to you, mean to you, cruel to you. You have to love them, but you don't have to take them to lunch. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about pure, unadulterated, unconditional love of God flowing through you, your heart, my heart. When was the last time that we didn't love somebody and we should thank God for that. We should thank God for those kind of people. But that isn't what unconditional love is about. That's not the type of interconnected love that I'm talking about here. Agape love is unconditional, impartial love which never makes any type of demand on anyone else. Agape love does not look like this. I will love you if you give me this, if you act a certain way, if you react a certain way. Agape love is offered without the expectation of anything in return. For this reason, Jesus told us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. And what Paul said, love is patient and kind. It is not arrogant or boastful. It does not insist on its own way. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Are we doing okay, sound folks? Are we okay? When they get up and walk around, it makes me nervous. <laughs> you know who loves unconditionally is this Cheryl the dog. She just smiles at me when I, when I make a statement. If we love unconditionally, like Paul said, we are enabled to do all of those things. With patience and kindness, we can bear and hope, believe, and endure everything that's going on in our world. That's because agape love is not the same as filial love or erotic love. Agape is unconditional, impartial, unexpectant love. Love with no strings attached. I'm not saying it's easy to love this way. Heck no. I can't do it. I can reach it once in a while. Feels pretty good, but no. I'm not saying it's easy. But remember this. Unconditional love is not a feeling. You're not going to get those oxytocin things in your brain that make you feel so good from unconditional love. You're going to feel good from it, but it's not an emotion. It's not a feeling. It's an attitude. Agape, unconditional love, is an action. It means that we're always attempting to keep from doing harm to anybody. And to the degree that we're able to do this, to the degree we're able to watch out for everybody's best interest, we can treat them with constant respect. I know we can't always like or admire everybody in the world, of course, but we are expected to love them. Can you love without respect? This is a debate. I'm not sure we want to get into that today, but can we? In this context, it means, agape in this context means to do good to them, to treat them with decency, 
to respect their humanity at all times. Over and over, when I do weddings, the many, many weddings I've done in my career, a couple will ask me to read 1 Corinthians 13. I'm a Spanish and I'm a scholar. And I always do, of course, if that's what they want. And I remind them that Paul was not talking about a married couple when he said these words in the Christian Bible. He was not talking to married couples, and married couples love it, of course, but he was actually talking to the people about the love of humanity. And it works for marital love, of course it does. Love is patient and kind. It doesn't require anything from the one who is loved, nor should it. It does not get bent out of joint if love is not offered in return. Love is not arrogant or rude. It never lords itself over anybody else in order for it to be extended. Nor does it speak ill of anyone who does not know how to reciprocate love. Love does not insist on its own way. It has no agenda. Impartial love is shown to everybody because it is impartial. Because we don't get to choose we don't get to just pick and choose those to whom this love is given because it's unsolid, unbridled, complete, unconditional love turned into action. Agape love is the love that God had for its creation itself. In the moment that spirit moved in an act of love and re created itself as you and me and all people. We learned about that love. We became that love. It's God's love expressed in human terms. In human terms. It's God's love in the way that we as human beings can express it on planet Earth. Agape is the kind of love that's called on by all of us who want all undocumented immigrants to have a chance to live in this country. That's the love we have to give to those people that want them sent away. Agape love is the love that we are called on to express to those Republicans yesterday in Washington, D.C. Agape is the kind of love that you would have been required to have if you lived in Amsterdam in 1943 and you were hiding Jewish children in your attic. Agape love is the kind of love that is needed to stand up to power and to address suffering caused by economic disparity in our society and around the world. Agape love is needed to stand up and courageously speak out that genocide and racism is wrong, no matter where it is. In Rwanda, in Bosnia, in Germany by the Nazis against the Jews, in Israel by the Israel government against the Palestinians, in the United States by our very own government against people of color. It is agape love that is called to turn into action. Agape love is what is needed to do something to help those people around us who are suffering, those who need access to good medical health care despite their employment or lack of, despite their income their nationality, or any other social issue. Agape love is what is called on for us to stand up and be counted in a world that is so desperate for this kind of love that is an action, not a feeling. Agape is self-giving love in action. It's risky. It's costly. And it's not for the faint of hearts. It's not for those people that think you can wrap love up in a box of chocolate hearts and a bouquet of flowers. Agape love is not for somebody that thinks love can be put in one day and everybody's okay. It's not. 
for those who are afraid. And John's Gospel quotes Jesus as saying that no one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. He's talking about agape love. Costly, sacrificial love that calls on us to stand in the dark places and speak from a platform of deep and abiding love and equality and justice for all people. It's a kind of love that calls on us to show people that we think they're wrong, that they're wrong exactly because we think they're wrong. It's what Jesus and Paul say our attitude should be towards those who have hurt us or wronged us those who have treated us badly. We are to give them the best that we can rather than the worst. That's about they love. Can we do it? <sighs> well, it's a challenge. It's the kind of love in which we know that God is our strength, our support, and our very heartbeat. That love that we are to show to everybody else because we are the expression of God here on earth. We are God's hands, God's voice, and God's heart. The old Brown says, do not say that God is in my heart but say that I am in the heart of God. I am in the heart of God. And when we remember that the reason we were brought to planet Earth in this moment, in this time, was to create a world that works for everyone, for all people. And because we are in the heart of God, and because God's love is unconditional love, Agape love never ends. Everything else in your life is going to end. That house you love, that car you drive, those clothes you're so proud of, even the person that you love, all of it will end. All of it will fade into the dust. All those things that you thought you loved and could not live without must end. This is love. But love, unconditional, Self-giving, agape love will never end, never end. So love, faith, and hope live on. These three, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is unconditional, impartial, agape love. A man's heart stopped. Hundreds of elephants' hearts are grieving. This man's abundant heart offered healing to those elephants and by extension to all of us. This wondrous connection of all beings, person to person, animal to person, animal to animal, and all of us to our interconnectedness with Mother Earth. When we come together, he said, our hearts form a bridge that open to our own healing. When we come together in a God of love, we form a bridge for healing ourselves and all others. When we take one step towards love. Love takes a thousand steps towards us. And love is a call to come home. Come home. Peace and blessings, my beloveds. So let's just take a deep breath together. And bring to your mind's eye right now your beloved. 
your beloved person, your beloved thing, your beloved pet or care, just right now, bring to your mind's eye your beloved. And send love there. Send love there. Wherever 
It is being called for when we take one step. Love takes a thousand steps towards us. And we say thank you, God. Thank you, infinite spirit. Thank you, living, loving life. And we let it be so. Leaving the vortex of the prayer open for a moment. For you just to place the prayers of your heart into it. Many, many different ways of giving, we are deeply appreciative. 
This is the mail that we received this week and the old fashioned mail through old fashioned checks or bill to pay. We even get cash occasionally in the mailbox behind the church. There are about 30 different ways to give to this church through e-giving. Please check that out through our text option, through our other ways of giving. And in the meantime, please know how deeply grateful we are that you share that which God has so abundantly and plentifully shared with you. So let's just take our gift, our offering, and our hands. Place your hand over your heart for those of you who are at home, just representing the love that you have for the Center for Spiritual Living of Boise. And that you know how deeply you are loved by us. And so we bless this, which we call money. But we know that it represents the flow and the circulation of life giving to itself. We say thank you, God, for this opportunity to share. Thank you for this opportunity to love. Thank you for this opportunity to be. And so we simply bless the gift and the giver saying, and so it is. Amen, amen, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, the beautiful, the talented, Lisa Bidding.